Woods. If you have not followed his Triple H Horse Racing Podcast, you're missing out. It's one of the best podcasts in the country. Good evening and welcome to episode 14 of Horsing Around right here on the HHH Racing Podcast. I'm your proud host, Howard Kravitz. Thank you very much for joining us tonight as we are going to be doing a few things, of which mainly talking about the huge day at fairgrounds this past Saturday with some very big performances and also talk a little NCAA basketball combo as well. Plus, we're going to start the show talking about Adelphi Racing and some ownership opportunities as well as power pick tip sheet conversation. Please follow us on X right there at H Kravitz. Hit that subscribe button at the bottom right hand side of the screen. Also smash that like button below the video player and up on the top right hand corner on YouTube. Please hit that notification bell so that you know when new content will arise. Of course, you can reach me on my email at uh, hkravitzhorse at gmail.com. It is scrolling right there. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Anchor. Let's talk about the tip sheet because for you, those of you that subscribe to the tip sheet, our PowerPix tip sheet, wow, did we have a day. Uh, Pete Visco and myself both hit the pick five uh, for over 1,200, and I gave out four winners on the uh, price pace spot plays, including a six to one, a nine to two, some other lower price horses. Look, it's this is a very tough game, and, and I'm wrong all the time, just like everyone else, but you got to celebrate the victories when they come. And the Power Picks tip sheet was absolutely on fire this past weekend. Look below the video player in the description if you are not a Power Picks tip sheet subscriber. And I don't know why you wouldn't be because it's only $4 every weekend. You can see Matt Miller at the bottom of the screen said the uh, Power Picks were fire this weekend. I picked a good weekend to pay good attention. Thanks so much, guys. Awesome picking. Thanks, Matt, for joining the show. And thanks for uh, the compliments. But, yeah, the, the tip sheet is something you, you definitely – want to look at we also have a great uh, website of course hhh racing podcast.com and we're on instagram also check us out there here's how i want to start before i bring in my co-host adelphi racing adelphi racing uh has is a very exciting time i'm a proud partner matt cutier racing manager i've been with adelphi about a year and a half now uh they have a horse called pandagate who just won the gander stakes in new york and is now in dubai running against uh, Forever Young in the UAE Derby this Saturday. So shout out and hats off to Adelphi Racing and Pandagate. Good luck to them and the Clements running on Saturday in a $1 million race. He's got a shot. He's by Arrowgate. He wants distance. He's going to be a bit of a price. I've seen 8 to 1, 10 to 1 on anti-post betting. But Adelphi Racing, we are huge. Uh, they sponsor us here. And We've talked about Crownsway Racing as, as an ownership possibility. Crownsway is another ownership possibility that you might be interested. Let me tell you a little bit about Adelphi Racing. They bought three horses at the Ocala, the OBS sale uh, down in Ocala, Florida. I'm going to very quickly talk about them and then show you how you can get involved in Adelphi Racing Club out of New York. They're great fans of the show, and we are of them. They bought three fillies. One is a more than ready Philly out of a Pen uh, Pennsylvania bred, uh, out of a, a mare called uh, a damn, sorry, Trace of Grace, who is very talented, eight-time winner. This horse is very precocious, is very quick. I'm going to go ahead and show you a little bit of information about the more than ready Philly. Uh, this is a very exciting prospect, and I want to be full disclosure. I've already bought into this horse, so if you if you you know want to know, is, is how we're just selling this horse out just because he's doing his job. No, this is a very talented horse. And I'm going to show you a little information there. There she is more than ready. Um, I'm not going to make the breeding bigger. You can get in touch with Matt Cuter. She's um, a little more stocky. She's not, you know, very tall, but she is quick. And I'll show you the breeze video. I'll make it a little bigger here. Um, again, she's being asked, but again, um, she's got a, a long stride for being a, 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 a smaller horse, and you can see she is very precocious. She's quick, more than ready. Also, uh, you know, she could be a, a turf horse, but they think that she's going to be a dirt. She worked 10 flat there, as you can see. This is a very talented horse, and she's a PA bred, so she'll be eligible for all the 
PA bread stakes as well. Uh, Adelphi is planning to run her in the summer at Saratoga. Patrick Hunzo, are you listening? Maybe we're going to see this Philly, uh, and I'll be in the winter circle with you at Saratoga. Going to Ray Handel, and which is awesome. So Ray's getting some very nice horses. That's a more than ready Philly. They have another Philly. They bought this is a twirling candy Philly. I'm going to go ahead and show that horse here in just a second. A twirling candy Philly. This horse is probably meant a little more uh, for two turns. She's a little bit longer. Uh, the mare is Strategic Dreams, who's also a stakes winning mare. She was very uh, precocious. She was not as quick on the workout, but she's taller and leggier. Let me show you this twirling can a candy filly that Adelphi just bought at the sale. And you don't have to be like a horse racing expert to see what I'm talking about. You see there she's longer. She's taller. Again, these are all two-year-olds, by the way. This is a twirling candy uh, filly. I'll go ahead and show her video. Again, not quite as quick. You can see she's just taller. This is going to be a two-turn horse. Also going to Ray Handel, by the way. This horse is also going to be in the Ray Handel barn. Worked well, again, by twirling candy out of the uh, Amer Strategic Dreams. Also worth like 10 and 1. Very nice horse. Um, again, take, I'll show you the walk video and you can just see what I'm talking about. Uh, just She's got a nice presence about her. She's longer, uh, more angular. Really nice horse. Joe Migliori picked her out. I can't say enough good things about Joe Migliori, Bloodstock agent, of course, son of Richard Migliori, works for Adelphi Racing and some others. And the other one they bought is a McKinsey filly. McKinsey's a, a new first crop sire. Uh, this one came in a nice bargain. They think highly of this McKinsey filly as well. So if you're interested in getting involved with Adelphi Racing, there's the information on the bottom of the screen. Uh, I'll leave it up for a minute. Those of you that are uh, listening um, on, on on our listening platforms, you go to adelphiracing.com. That's the website. The email for Matt Couture is matt at adelphi, A-D-E-L-P-H-I, racing, one word, matt at adelphiracing.com. So again, adelphiracing.com or matt at adelphiracing.com. They sell fast, everyone. Adelphi Racing does not mess around. They're going to sell within a few weeks. I will also say, before I bring on my co-host here, they're a little more expensive than Crownsway. You're probably going to have to spend four digits to get into these horses. But Matt Kutzer will work with you, I promise. He's a great guy. Adelphi Racing, can't say enough good things about them. Three fillies they bought at March OBS, of which I'm involved with two of them. I bought a piece of the... More than ready Philly and also the twirling candy Philly. So I'm proud to talk about them. All right. Let's talk about fairgrounds. And to help me talk about the fairgrounds card from Saturday, he's a gentleman that has been on as much as as uh, we'd all love to see. But again, life gets in the way sometimes. But he's been back now on a few shows. Uh, is an excellent handicapper. We'd love to see him. Here he is from New Jersey, co host of Bed and Booze and Mr. Patrick Kunzel. Pat, how are you doing tonight? Good evening. Uh, doing well. Everything's good. Wonderful. Uh, Delphi, man, they're coming on strong. They bought some nice horses at the OBS sale. They bought three fillies, so I've got two more girls in my stable. And like I said, we've been in the we've been in the paddock before. I heard there's a, a picture of us from last year. Maybe we'll be in the pack at Saratoga this summer to see one of these talented fillies run. You never know. Yeah. Oh, that's always fun up in the paddock at Saratoga. And also just to hit on the Delphi. The group is just a ton of fun, you know, being with you at the Belmont, um, you know, hanging out with them in the boxes and stuff like that. They're all a great group of people, and it's a really fun group to get with. So I re highly recommend it. Yeah, and Matt's taking care of you, too. I mean, there's you're not, you don't even have any horses with Adelphi mm -hmm. ownership-wise, and you've gone to Saratoga. You're like, Howard, who can I get in touch with? I said, see if Matt. And Matt's, like, taking care of you with without even being a partner. He's just He's just a great guy. Oh, great guy. And, you know, getting to go into the barns of, you know, the horses that he owns of different trainers and stuff like that. Like a young kid like me, you know, not really growing up to horse racing to now loving it and being able to see the behind the scenes and what goes on. Really appreciative of what Matt's done for me. And, you know, Adelphi, I, like I said, can't say enough. Yeah, he's on a 13-hour plane ride right now, Pat, to uh, Dubai. Probably getting there very soon, by the way, or in the next, like, four or five hours. So, But when you're in a million-dollar race... Uh, you know, with a chance to go to the Derby, 
I think you and I would get on that plane in a heartbeat. Uh, let's see. We got uh, Terry Frank is here. Good evening, everyone. Tipsy was incredible last weekend. Thanks, Terry. Horsey Dave is here. Cellist, uh, which was my play of the day at Turfway, helped me get a big double. Congratulations, Horsey Dave. Mark Bogaz is here. Good evening. Handicappers. We got Tom Espinoza is here. Uh, that is great. Who else? Matthew Chamorro. Penn State Scott representing the Northeast. He's here. What's up, Penn State Scott? All right. We're going to talk about three races real quick, Patrick. The first race we're going to talk about is the Munez Turf Race Saturday at the fairgrounds. One by this horse. I'll bring it on the screen and make it a little bigger. We've been waiting for some of these turf horses from Chad Brown to come on the scene. I'm very busy. Who ran a big second to warm heart, Patrick, uh, at the on Pegasus Day was absolutely fantastic winning this race. And maybe, and he's a Pennsylvania bred, by the way. I want to mention that. Uh, maybe this is Chad's next good one. You can see that final quarter coming home. Sorry, the final eighth coming home at 11. 0.56. But what I want to do here, Patrick, is show the replay. And I, what I really want to do, as I'm bringing on the screen here, is focus on Irad Ortiz. Because look, everyone's like, oh, Irad always gets on the best horses. Okay, he, he wins with prices too, by the way. His turf riding is just completely insane. I'm not really saying anything that we don't know, Patrick, but I'll show you an example. He was in the 13 hole. I'm going to show the beginning of this race, Patrick, and I'll let you talk about it, and I'll show the stretch run. This is an absolutely perfect ride. Watch what he does here from the 13 hole with I'm Very Busy. Uh, he breaks. He's got tactical speed, Patrick. He's right here. But watch him look to his left and find a way down. I know the camera's bad. There we go. Find a way to the rail from the 13 hole, Patrick. Ridiculous. Yeah, ridiculous. And he just, you know, there's a couple horses taken back, and then he, you know, finds a lane there and can just take him, take on very busy all the way to the rail pretty much eventually. And, you know, in this long stretch to the first turn, it's that was vital. And this horse, you know, getting to the rail and being able to save as much ground as possible for, you know, which ends up being, you know, at, in the back stretch there. This horse ends up, you know, starting to angle out a little bit and get yeah. off the rail, which was even more impressive. It's a little bit hard to see, but there is traffic. I'm very busy is right here, the sort of white silks. And the other horse, Web Slinger, is second on the outside. He's Web Slinger is in between horse. I know it's a bit hard to see here. But again, here's I'm very busy where my cursor is. Here's Web Slinger. And just Irad, I'll tell you what the big move to me. And like you said, there's a spot where it looked like Irad could have split in between. But instead, Patrick, like, goes three and four wide and gets mm -hmm. out into the clear. And that was the key. You see, I mean, look at this. He's got he's got a nice hold. They were going pretty quick. But, like, right coming up, Patrick, you'll see. You see how there's traffic, and he's got a decision to make. And you'll see right here I'll go into the three path. And once he angles out, I thought the key move was right, right there coming up. Once he angles out, Patrick, he's right here. He's right here and just tips out. Yep. Like right here, if he's got the horse, you know he's going to win. He's right here. Meanwhile, Web Slinger, by the way, is behind him. I'll just let it run through. Real nice turn of foot here. Yeah, very impressive. And, you know, Irad could have, you know, changed his mind and went inside, and who knows what happens. The yeah. way he saved ground like that there was just awesome. And like you reiterated, I mean, it was just – he gets he might get on the best horses more times than not, but he'll give them a good ride more times than not too. And keep in mind, for everyone, he was geared down there. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. He was geared down there late, Patrick. So I'm not saying he would have run another few points faster, but he was geared down late. So, you know, he probably had a little more to give. Web Slinger, man, I, I got to tell you, I, I didn't like him in this race. He always takes money. He won on Derby Day last year, Patrick, in the American Turf and broke my heart against Farbridge. That was a, oof, that was a rough beat. But anyway, he's a nice horse. But he just takes a lot of money because his name, everyone likes the clothes. He doesn't win a lot, Patrick. He, he's just a play against for me in most races. He just has too, ground to make, too much ground to make up, and he doesn't have the turn of foot of the top horses. So you're always behind the eight ball, man, when you're coming from that far back. Yeah, and I've always had a, a spot in my heart for Web Slinger uh, throughout the summer in Saratoga. I was, I liked that horse in a couple races. And, you know, you're right. The horse does uh, collect some checks, uh, but it just never really seems to get there. Gigante ran a nice race, beatbox in fourth. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and show the incremental pace. I think I showed it there. Oh, it's a little bit hard to see, but there it is. The final eighth and 11.5. Anything sub 12, Patrick, is good. 
Uh, this is wow. very good. Webslinger came almost came as as fast, you know, almost. But again, he was a few lengths back, so that makes a difference. There's a race at Churchill, Patrick, a million dollar race, the old Forester uh, Turf Classic. It's a million dollar race. It's the one that was run by Upton Mark. We need some good two turn Americans running Patrick because we got to replace up to the mark and I got a feeling I'm very busy and maybe a horse called integration who I loved on Pegasus day. They got into trouble might be going to that race uh, far bridge. There's a lot of really nice three olds from last year. I got a feeling the American older turf two turn crop might be pretty good this year. Yeah. And I think, you know, getting close to Keeneland, we'll see a couple more uh, come up and it'll, it'll be exciting. I, especially cause I think a couple might be in the Chad Brown barn. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Uh, Chad Brown's going to unleash his armada. 103 buyer for I'm very busy. I guess last question, and then we're going to move on, Pat. We don't know what's going to happen. Is I'm very busy? Maybe a potential Breeders' Cup turf horse? I'm not saying he's going to win the Breeders' Cup, but could he be that good? Or, I mean, he's only a four-year-old, and he's improving. Or is it too early to say? What's your gut feeling with this horse? Uh, I'll trust Chad on the turf any day of the week. You know, I in the Breeders' Cup, uh, I'm blanking on the horse's name in the Breeders' Cup uh, juvenile turf, uh, but he gets these horses ready to go at the right time, and I think we'll hear about I'm Very Busy uh, at the beginning of November uh, out in California while we're all there partying at Del Mar. Yeah, yeah we'll be there too. Uh, by the way, <laughs> speaking of which, are you going to be somewhere in two weeks? Where are you going to be in two weeks? Yeah, I'm going to be, uh, what do they call it, the Bluegrass State for the first time in my life uh, at yes, Keelan sir. Racecourse. With... Actually, three weeks. I was wrong. Sorry, it's three weeks. Go ahead. Yeah, no, it, I, I can't wait to get there and see everybody. Um, it's going to be a blast being able to go to Keeneland and getting a tour of all different, um, specifically Godolphin. Uh, it's going to be an amazing time. Yeah, and you've never been to Keeneland, correct? So it's very exciting. Uh, we Never been to Keeneland. And, you know, I know we laugh about it. I'll bring it up again. How when we were in Saratoga last summer, we were driving by, I think it was the War Dancer Farm. And, you know, I looked out and I said, oh, how beautiful is that? And you turn to me and you just go, oh, you must have never been to Keeneland. Well, I mean, the War Dancer farm is nice, but it's just one farm and it's not yeah. surrounded by, I mean, if you think that farm is nice, wait wait till you see Lexington, Patrick. You might, you might never go back to New Jersey. Um, it, it's pretty cool. Let's talk about the Fairgrounds Oaks. Uh, the Fairgrounds Oaks was the three-year-old um, Philly prep for the Oaks, Patrick. Myself, Pete, and Paul, especially, we've talked about sort of waiting for some of these three old girls to really step up with their buyers and just improve. This is a serious horse. This was Tarifa wins, uh, pays $5 over our pretty woman, who's an Aspis in Philly, first time stake run, who I thought ran huge. You see the buyers there, 95, 93. This was a, this was serious racehorse time. This was really a good race. You see the incremental race. They came home in a nice final time. And like I said, the buyer was really good. I'm going to go ahead and show the replay of that race here in just a second as I'm going to bring it up. I got to switch some things there on the screen, but Tarifa is a good dolphin horse. Of course, pretty mischievous one last year. Uh, they might repeat again, Patrick, because Tarifa looks serious. Yeah, very serious. Uh, I was ultra impressed with that performance, especially considering um, the seven horse for Asmussen, our pretty woman. She, uh, you know, had it on the front end and, Joel didn't really have to ask too much of her uh, until late. And Tarifa it got just a little, came it on. got a little tight in here. Watch this, Pat. I mean, Tarifa had to take, see the head carriage there. Got a little there. rank there, yeah. But she, you know, you got bumped. But you know what? She didn't like go crazy on Rosario and, or was it Flavian? I'm sorry, I can't. Who's Tarifa? Who rode Tarifa? Was it uh, Rosario? Fla uh, Flavian. Flavian. Yeah. So, you know, when you see a three, let me back that up. I think this is underrated. This could have been a disaster for Tarifa, but, but yeah. she rated kindly and was able to handle it. That's huge going forward, Patrick, to me. Oh, 100%. I mean, yeah, it, that, that horse is had to deal with a lot of, a lot of issues early and came on like this and stayed with it and stayed on the pace, which was even more impressive sitting right off our pretty woman and then just pounced. And, you know, this deep stretch at fairgrounds, these two started to duel. And, you know, I really did think, I know I said it before, but I really did think our pretty woman prior to Joel asking at the top of the stretch had a lot more left. And Tarifa just came on, came on and just pounced. 
That was impre- I'll tell you, that was very impressive by Our Pretty Woman, too. I, I want to give her short shrift. And I would have preferred Our Pretty Woman for the pick five, even though, selfishly, I'll just say I did hit it. But because Tarifa won, I was only singled to a horse in the last uh, in the last race in the Louisiana Derby. We'll talk about that race. That, that worked out okay for me. But this is a serious horse. The other story is intricate, who personally I, I it was my Oaks horse until Saturday. I don't know what happened, Patrick. I haven't heard anything. If anyone's heard anything, let me know. Maybe she bled. Because when, when a really talented horse does this, Patrick, something went wrong. This is not normal. Yeah, it's not normal at all. And I hate seeing that type of stuff. But um, hopefully the horse can bounce back and she, she'll be able to stay on the trail or you know maybe to get to the Oaks if everything's okay and nothing too serious. Yeah, I don't really know what happened there. We'll, we'll, we'll have to find out. Let me just go ahead and show uh, Tarifa here. Here's Tarifa's PPs right now. What you got to love about this horse, Patrick, or any horse you handicap, look at the buyer increase, 86, 90, 95. She's by Bernardini out of an awesome again mare. She just checks all the boxes. Right now, you got to believe this is your Oaks favorite. I would say so, yes. Um, you know, just FYI, you know, what she, I don't know. She's back on the work tab. That's the horse that we've all eyed, you know, since yeah. the uh, uh, juvenile fillies. So it's Tarifa, I would say, is cemented as the favorite right now. There's a horse you mentioned to me earlier today from the Chad Brown barn that is coming back from uh, her two-year-old race is called Ways and Means, who's running in the Gulfstream Oaks. That is a very talented three-year-old. I'm fascinated to see what she can do, Patrick. Although I'm a little concerned that she doesn't have a prep before this race on Saturday at Gulfstream. You and the boys will be talking about that on Wednesday, though, right? Yeah, can't wait to talk about her. Uh, Wayne's, Ways and Means saw her on debut at Saratoga, uh, you know, standing right along the paddock side there. And what a what a beautiful filly. Um, so I'm excited to see how she does, if she's going to need one. And, you know, I think it'd be great if she could uh, set herself up for maybe an Oaks start. Uh, I hope she runs well because I'd like to see some depth. It feels like there's more depth in the Derby right now than there's in the Oaks. And I think it's fair to say that was probably not the only talented and uh, sorry, not well talented and beautiful Philly you saw at Saratoga of the four legged and two legged kind. Most likely if you're up in, in Saratoga Springs, is that correct, Pat? Correct. <laughs> that, that, that is very correct. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Notwithstanding your wonderful girlfriend, of course, but you know, she'll she'll yeah. be up there with you at some point, I'm sure. Um, anyway, yeah. let's talk about the last race, Louisiana Derby. Um, full disclosure, I was singled to catching freedom as a lone A. We all, Pete Paul and I on the show Thursday night, Pat, we all liked catching freedom. Um, I needed catching freedom to win the pick five. That was the only horse I was alive to. Obviously, it worked out real well for me and anyone else who would catching freedoms. I go ahead and show the uh, results there. Catching freedom paid eight sixty. Pat. I mean, nothing wrong with that. I know it's a big field, but we all thought she was uh, he was probably you know the most talented horse. But the way he did it, Patrick, coming from last, which is not what Chad necessarily wanted, was very impressive. Anna Marie finished second. Tuscan Gold to me is a very interesting horse. We got to talk about finished third. I'll show the buyer here on the screen. A 97 buyer for Catching Freedom. Anna Maria, 96. Tuscan Goal, 95. I mean, it was a fast race by the numbers, and there's good things and bad things. I was happy to cash. I was happy for Brad Cox. Selfishly, Patrick, for myself and the rest of the podcast, Sierra Leone's got some competition now, my friend. Yeah. Uh, he definitely does. Uh, the one thing I'll say before we show the replay, you know, I did look, um, I did look up, you know, this, the last four runnings of this race now being at uh, a mile and three sixteenths, this was the third slowest out of four. Um, take that for what it's worth. Uh, you know, I'm not sure, obviously catching freedom had got a great buyer. So, you know, it's kind of one of those things, uh, where, you know, you can use it against him, but also the buyer is, says a lot. Now, Pat, he didn't break great, and we've talked about this before. You have to break in the Derby. You don't have to break on top. You just have to break clean, right? Because if you do this in the Derby, you can really be caught in a jackpot. That was my concern with Tappet Trice last year, right, as a, as a horse that we followed. Catching Freedom, okay, he's not a speed horse. He's not going to be on the lead. 
But he's if he breaks like this in the derby, that's going to be a bigger problem. He's the five. You can see, I mean, he would have gotten pinched a lot more. I mean, there would be a lot more horses. He goes all the way back to last. I mean, if you're a fan of this horse, which I was in this race, I was not really happy. Here's Track Phantom uh, going to lead. Hall of Fame is the two right here. I was very disappointed. I, I'm off Hall of Fame right now. I did like him. The horse that I think is really interesting kind of this race, I'm catching freedom, is this horse right here, Tuscan Gold, another horse for Chad, who is actually coming out of Sierra Leone's maiden race. Look how far back catching freedom is. I'll show the first turn here. Tuscan Gold is 3-4 wide the whole way, Pat, in the yellow. Yeah, that, that was um, tough to be four wide early on like that and had to make up a lot of ground along the back stretch there. Um, you know, you see Hall of Fame on the inside. You know, I, I found it interesting that, you know, I know they asked me some barn probably wanted both horses forwardly placed, but I wasn't that really fond of Hall of Fame being that much uh, mm -hmm. forward. Yeah. And this is, you know, it's, it's honest, but it's not too quick. Here's at this point, I was a little worried track fan was going to wire this thing. I'm, I'm not a track phantom fan going distance. I said it before the show. I said it after I did not like him in this race. I had him as a C as in cat again, Tustin gold's very wide. Take a look at catching freedom. This is a very confident ride by Flavin. He's not panicking right here, Patrick. And once he winds up, he'll be right next to Anna Marie. So watch, on Marie is going to be the seven um, and catching freedom is going to be just to his outside. And there's some bumping going on. You're going to see there's the orange. Let me freeze it. Yep, I'll try to freeze it. Okay. Here's on Marie. Here's catching freedom outside. Pat, talk about the stretch run. What, what's going on here between these two? Cause there's some action going on here. Yeah. These two kind of right like there. hook up with each other on Marie bounces, catching freedom out more. Um, and then, you know, catching freedom, finally gets to angle straight and just pounces and just starts collecting up everybody. I mean, this was just impressive. Sierra Leone-esque, could we say? <laughs> uh, I would think so. You know, I, I just like to look back to the uh, Risen Star when uh, Sierra Leone got caught catching freedom as catching freedom was a little bit more forward and it just pounced on them like that too. So this is... Uh, we definitely have some competition. Well, the thing I do want to say, though, and you know I'm a, a very studious when it comes to replays, maybe too much so, Pat, but it's done well for me in the past, as you well know, is Catching Freedom was on his wrong lead. He was on his left lead before he bumped. He didn't switch leads to about the 16th pole. That, you have to be professional in the derby. And as if you like Catching Freedom, that's got to be a little bit, of a concern. In fact, Matthew Chimero says, I wouldn't even worry about catching freedom in the Derby. Well, okay. He's similar to Angel Vampire last year. Tuscan Gold is who I want going forward. Only horse who stood in there in a race that collapsed. I, I thought Tuscan Gold Matthew ran huge. I thought he ran as big as anyone in the race. Matt Miller said on Marie ran huge. Uh-oh. Reminds me of Mage running a really nice second to Forte in Florida Derby. This performance will likely be ignored. But that horse was just as impressive at catching freedom. Matt, I'm gonna I'm gonna push back. I think the best horse in this race for catching freedom in Tuscan Gold. Anne Marie did run well though, Pat. I mean, there's some nice closers lining up in this race. But look look at Tuscan. I'll, I'll show again the, the lead change, Pat. You tell me what you think. Um, again, watch carefully. He's on his left lead. You know, he did stay straight though. But you can see. Okay, so right here he's fine. But right, it's hard to tell, but. Right here, he's not on his correct lead. Again, he's, he, you see his his carriage is not right. He's right there. You see he's on his wrong lead. And right right there, he switched mm -hmm. to his right and came on. Here's Tuscan Gold, who was four wide. And he stays on, Pat. I mean, this is – he only has 25 derby points. I don't think he's going to get in the derby. This horse right here, Tuscan Gold, to me is like my Belmont Travers horse right now. I really like that horse. Yeah. I mean, one question I would have for you regarding this finish, you know, sometimes when we see, you know, four or five horses uh, line up, uh, you know, at the wire, does that signal sometimes a weaker race? Possibly. They, I mean, it wasn't like a photo finish, though. And yeah. I think Catching Freedom and Amory were really moving. Remember, this was mile 316th, Pat, and they're going to get an extra 16th in the Derby. So... You know, that's why I, I hope track fan goes to the Derby because I don't like him at all in the Derby. I didn't like him in this race, but I want speed to be in there. 
I think he'd be really good in the Pat Day Mile. Patrick, we'll see what they do. No, I think this was a pretty strong race. It didn't, I hear what you're saying. It didn't feel like a clunk up kind of bunched up ending. It, it felt like those horses were really moving forward. So anyway, uh, that was the Louisiana Derby. I'm not going to show the points. We can talk about it on, on Thursday, but uh, you know, Anna Marie is in catching freedom is in Tuscan golds, 25 track Phantom track, excuse me, track phantom is in no one else in this field uh, is in. So we got some big races coming up though, Pat. We got the Florida Derby and Arkansas Derby this weekend. Fierceness, I think, is the one everyone's going to be really watching to see what he can do in the Florida Derby. Again, you'll be talking about that on Wednesday, correct, with the guys. Yeah, excited to cover that card at Gulfstream. That's that's going to be a fun one. For sure. All right, Pat. Now, let's get to the NCAA. Don't go anywhere because Patrick is not only an excellent handicapper, he mm-hmm. is a very good sports better. He, he plays... Uh, he, he bets college basketball like uh, Charlie Freeman. Uh, he does well at it. I know for a fact he had a, a good weekend. Patrick, let's just quickly go through each region. We're not going to project things going forward because you guys are going to do that Wednesday. What I want to do is just talk about two things in each region. And everyone needs to pay attention because if you're if you enjoy college basketball, you've got brackets alive, or you're, you like to bet college basketball, listen to what Pat's got to say. He's got some good insight. We're going to go through – each region, Pat, I want to know two things. What teams impressed you the most and what team maybe surprised you in the opening weekend of the NCAA tournament? I think that's big enough there. Let's talk about the East region first. UConn, the prohibitive favorite, and San Diego State match up out of this a section of the bracket. Who impressed you over the weekend? Yeah, I mean, you can't, you know, walk over UConn, number one overall seed, just, you know, beating up on, you know, the 16 seed in Stenson and then takes Northwestern and the game was over by the uh, first media timeout. This team is just so, you know, versatile and they could do, they could beat you in so many different ways. Uh, defensively, you know, with the seven footer and clinging inside, they, they, they're really impressive. And now we get a, um, you know, a rematch of the national championship last year, uh, you know, with a really fun San Diego state team um, who, you know, is playing really well. Um, and you get, that two, three game with uh, Iowa state and Illinois, you know, I've been really impressed with Illinois, you know, sometimes you, you win your, you know, your conference tournament and you come in, you know, above your shoulders a little bit and you don't really know what's, yeah. what they're going to do it. They're offensively with Shannon have been t- with Terrence Shannon jr. They've been really good. And th- they beat, they beat up on uh Duquesne pretty early and it was not a pretty game. So, very impressive. That's going to be a fun matchup. That's two polar opposite teams, uh, Illinois and Iowa State. You know, one's going to want to stop you defensively. The other one's going to want to score as much as they can. So that's going to be a really, really fun game. And I know we have a co-host that's going to be going to that. So that's going to be uh, – I'm excited for him, Paul, I to do. See. That's going to be in Boston, correct, at the, at the uh, to what, TD, TD Garden. T- of- TD Garden, yep. So he'll get to yep. see UConn and all – he'll get to see the UConn fans. Oh, jeez, they <laughs> – I wonder what co-host to... that might. Oh yeah, Paul Halloran. Yeah, he won't yeah, be so there. That... Yeah, so that'll be. Uh, he'll get. He'll get to see two great games. That'll be fun. Yeah, I want to just bring this up. I I just want to get back to the catching freedom. Mike Saletta. I'm not sure I've seen your name too much in the chat. Thanks for joining the show. Matt Saletta said that Pratt mentioned catching freedom was spooked by an inside horse breaking through the gate, mm. Mm. and he even bumped his head and buckled in the gate before the start. He did act up a little bit. I did see that. It might be why he didn't break well. It's a good point. I did see him act up a little bit. Thanks for that information. Um, really, a lot of favorites uh, did well, especially in the second round, Pat. I think you've got a stat. or uh, It's something that's very interesting for the Sweet 16 because there are not a lot of uh, high seeds uh, in this Sweet 16. No, I mean, money line favorites um, in the second round went 15 and one. Uh, you know, the only one that wow. uh, didn't win was Baylor, who lost to Clemson, um, who Clemson's, you know, a very, very good team from the ACC. And one little note uh, the ACC, uh, you know, they got what, four teams in the tournament? It looks like all four are still dancing. So, you know, we could hit on these conferences being bad, you know, having bad regular seasons. You know, the ACC seems to show up every year when it comes tournament time. And I, I think that, you know, you get Duke Houston, you know, I see that on the screen. We get them. Uh, that's going to be an awesome, awesome game. Duke's looked really, really good. Uh, Houston. I mean, I don't know if you caught that game last night late, I did, 
I mean, they had. I was multitasking. I was, <laughs> I was watching the game and doing something else. But anyway, we won't talk about that right now. <laughs> yeah, no, that was that was an incredible game. I think you look at the ESPN uh, predictor thing that they have. You know, they give the percentage of you know throughout the game. Yeah, yeah. It was ninety nine point eight at one point. Uh, I mean, just an incredible collapse. But I give them a ton of credit. I mean, for bouncing back. I mean, you as a former coach. I mean. You, what do you do? You get your team in a huddle after that, blowing that lead, and you got your three best players fouling out. Like, how do you recover from that? So, well, when you're used to winning, you just find a way, and you know, yep. and they're very well coached, and you know, they they were able to fight through in overtime. I I know Duke is playing well. I, I just have a feeling Houston's going to roll. I really do. I think Houston. If I were betting, it's also going to be the game is in Dallas. I know Duke is used to you know tough atmosphere. This is not like your classic Duke team. I'm sorry. They're there. I don't know what the spread is. I, if it's like, it's what is probably minus four or five ish. I, I would guess. I don't, I don't know if you know what it is, but well, anyway, we're not gonna talk about going forward, but I, I like Houston in that game. Yeah. Quite four, a and a, four and a half. It is. And I agree with you. My part. Yeah. yeah, no, no uh, you, got pul- you got the yeah. pulse. Yeah. You got the yeah, pulse. I got the pulse <laughs> on it. Uh, let's go on the bottom of that region. Um, you got Marquette and NC state. I'll tell you what Marquette was in a game. Colorado's probably underrated. Good for Shaka, by the way, who has not been great in the tournament lately. What's your feeling of the teams uh, from the weekend in this bracket? Obviously, we're not going to talk about the team furthest to the right there, that three seed that one of our co-hosts uh, wanted to see win. But that was that was that that's a whole other story. We could talk about that for an hour. I'm talking about UK, of course. But anyway, uh, NC State, Marquette, what's your thoughts of this uh, section? Yeah, no, I think Marquette's getting more dangerous as the tournament goes on, especially because, you know, getting Tyler Kolick back there, you know, point guard uh who does pretty much everything for them uh, i think they're gonna just get better and better and you know nc state you know they've played i think it's like eight games in 12 days it's an absurd amount um you know that yeah. oakland game was fantastic but uh you know like i said i think marquette is getting more dangerous and uh i would love to see a, a houston marquette date in the elite eight i think that'll be a tremendous tremendous game any shot with NC State? I mean, again, it's the Big East, and or sorry, it's the ACC. Um, I think one of the reasons why, and I'm I'm a little bit old school, Pat, as you know, but you know the ACC always plays a tough non-conference schedule. I think that helps a lot. And I was going to mention the Big East. Uh, one of your favorite coaches in the world, Mr. Hurley. I'm being facetious. I know you're not a huge fan, even though the team is awesome. Was sort of complaining that the Big East only got two in there. I know they both advance, but you're, you're out there in, in the Northeast. Of course, you know, the big East very well. Did they deserve more teams in this tournament or do you think it was pretty fair? Uh, I would say they deserved more teams in this tournament. Just going off the fact that you look at other conferences, specifically the mountain West, uh, who is not only have they lost, but they've lost by a wide margin throughout the whole tournament. And yeah. that's, you know, what you kind of have to look at. And, you know, I, I hate to like say that, but, if you see a conference continue constantly getting beat up in this tournament year after year, it, sometimes it's, you know, you got to just realize that it's not really it. And that leads us to Purdue, Utah state. I know Utah state beat TCU, uh, but that game was pretty ugly. <laughs> Purdue, Purdue is a team on a mission. Uh, you could get them at plus 600 right now to win a national championship. You know, they could pull the Virginia on us, you know, lose to a 16 seed, and come back and win the national championship. I'm not saying they're going to do it, but you could get them at that. They face a tough Gonzaga team who handled Kansas, you know, shorthanded Kansas. Got to feel bad for them. Uh, and then that Creighton Tennessee game to talk about, uh, you know, one running gun team, Creighton, who's going to just try and chuck threes and run on you uh, against a Tennessee team who I know we talked about over the weekend, you and I, against Texas State. You know, it felt like they were up. 20 points you looked at the scoreboard with two minutes to go and it was a three-point game uh and texas had a shot to tie the game at the buzzer so that was a really good game uh i look for tennessee though you know rick barnes has not made it into the second weekend in a long long time and when he gets there he usually does pretty well uh creighton might be in tough waters in this spot with the length and the toughness that tennessee shows Sometimes when a when a I always think it's high or low. If if they're one or two, that's a high seed, right? Everyone Yeah, high seed, yeah. It's a high seed. Okay. Yeah. Uh when a high seed barely gets through, Pat, 
I think that's a really good thing. It's like they survived the game that they were, could have lost. They fought through it. You know they're going to be better. I think I think they're going to beat Creighton pretty handily. I, I like Tennessee a lot. What were they, 1 for 20, I think? Actually, they were 0 for 19, I think, with the three-point line at one point. So I'm like, they didn't hit a three until late. Uh, completely ridiculous. I just think they're going to play better. Uh, and I, I like Tennessee coming out of there. Let's talk about the other side. Let's talk about the West. Uh, North Carolina, who a lot of people thought Michigan State was going to beat them. There was a lot of buzz that Michigan State was going to beat North Carolina. North Carolina just stepped on them. They're they're getting hot at the right time. They face Alabama. And then you've got, on the other side, Clemson, who I'll tell you what, Baylor's just an enigma. I mean, if you're a Baylor fan, they got all the a ton of talent, athletic ability, and they just disappoint a lot, it feels to me. They didn't last year, but it, it just this year they did. Um, against an Arizona team, Pat, who I believe, I, I don't want to misquote Charlie, but I think he said, and a lot of people felt like Arizona might be a little bit vulnerable, but they move on as well. Yeah, they handled uh, Dayton. They played very well. Um, you know, with that punch of uh, Caleb Love and Amor Balo, th- that team is very good. Two older guards that they can rely on. Uh, Clemson plays very, very good defense. You know, they got that center in the middle in Hall. Um, you know, that game against Baylor, like you said, Baylor just turned the ball over, constant mistakes, you know, chucking threes that were just really not necessary. Um, I, I Clemson's going to – they're going to be a tough out. You know, watching them in the ACC all year long, they're going to be a tough out. You know, I, I saw them play against uh, Syracuse a couple times, and I, I did say to myself, this team, if they could find a way to get in, they're, they're, they're tough. Um, yeah. But they're also dealing with – a different animal in Arizona who, you know, has talent across the board. Um, All right, Patrick, and, oh, I'm sorry. Matt Miller needs some help. You, you know, the guy's poor. He's broke. He never wins anything. Let's help out Matt Miller. Thoughts on Arizona Clemson. Thinking Arizona is going to be play of the round for me. I'd love counter arguments. I don't know what the spread is, but what's your feeling on the Arizona Clemson game? Who do you like? There? Yeah, no, I, I do like uh, Arizona. It's spread six and a half. Um, I, Ooh, I think they'll lot. be up. Yeah, it, it is a lot. I think that's telling you something, though. Uh, hand for hand, I think Arizona's going to be able to score at will on this team. Uh, Clemson really hasn't faced an offensive team like Arizona uh, in a while. So this is, uh, I think Clemson's in deep waters in this spot. All right, I'm going to give you a trivia. Don't don't look at the chat, Pat. Try Try not to look at the chat right now. Okay, Trivia I'm question, probably. you ready? From Penn yep. State, Scott. There's only two teams left that are in the top 10 in offense and defensive stats. Who do you think they are in the country? Offensive and defensive stats. Two teams that are left. I'll scroll through the teams again. You know, you know who's left, but who do you think they are? The two teams that are in the top 10 U- offensively and defensively. UConn, UConn is not one of them, according to Penn State, Scott. Interesting. Okay, so then I'll go North Carolina. No. All right. Well, that uh, one more, and then if I don't get this, I'm done. Okay. Uh, Arizona and Iowa State. Wow. Yeah, you gave love to Iowa State. Yeah, I mean the Illinois Iowa State might be the game of the of the round. Oh, I agree. That, that is a very good game. Very very, very good game. And that, that, you know, that also leads us to North Carolina, Alabama. Uh, you know, I'm not going to lie. I did think uh, Michigan State had a very good chance against North Carolina. They just, yeah. they, they really haven't showed it to me too much yet this year. Uh, but, you know, Michigan State gave up that 20 to 1 run in the, uh, in the first half there uh, that just blew the game out. It was a complete blitz by them. They made all the big plays when needed. Uh, you know, they got the senior guard in R.J. Davis and that the center Baycott who's back, you know, fifth year. I know I'm hitting on obvious players on that team, but, you know, they're they're playing really well. And that'll be a really fun game because Alabama just wants to go, go, go. I'm going to ask you one more question, Pat, and then we'll end the show. We really appreciate We got a ton of people watching. And please make sure you hit the subscribe button on the bottom right-hand side of the screen. Check out our Power Picks tip sheet information if you're not a subscriber. Again, we had a huge week last week with a lot of winners. Here's my question, Pat. Some of these teams, the higher seeds, get to you know play in, pretty, in, in sites that are very close to them, i.e. UConn playing in Boston, et cetera, et cetera. And they deserve it. I don't have a problem with it, by the way. I'm not, that's not my question. My question to you is, do you think it's a bigger advantage in the earlier rounds 
for teams to have more fans and regional, you know, um, uh, um, playing in the region? Or do you think it's more advantage like in the Sweet 16 where they're playing better teams and they have a bigger fan base? Like, where would the fans or being close at home matter more later in the tournament or early tournament? I just think it's an interesting conversation. Yeah, no, definitely. And uh, Danny Hurley brought it up. Uh, he was asked about it the other night. You know, he thinks he got quote unquote shafted by the committee on, you know, who's in their region team wise, but you know, they'll play in Boston. That'll be a home environment for them. And I think that's yeah. huge. So I think sweet 16 elite eight to answer your question is way more important. Um, you know, you, UConn's one of them, and then you can look at Houston, who you talked about, who will get Duke, who Duke likes to travel. So Houston won't have to obviously travel to get their fans there at all, and that'll be a home environment from them. And Purdue, yeah. Purdue will get uh, – that'll be a home game for them against Gonzaga in Indianapolis. So, uh, yeah, uh, Sweet 16, Elite Eight, you get in your region, you could stay somewhat home. UConn hasn't had to uh, take a plane in almost a month. Since the beginning, well, actually, it's been well, well over a month, um, and you know they won't have to until they uh, have to go to Phoenix um, to uh, the Final Four if they make it there. Do you think that's fair? I mean, do you have a problem with these high these higher seeds also getting like home court advantages in the in the Sweet Sixteen Elite Eight? Do you think it should be more like neutral sites because you know those games are going to have big crowds anyway? So the 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 counter argument is why do the why, did, why does the NCAA feel the need to do that when they're going to have full stadiums anyway? Yeah, you know, the early games, you'd be surprised that sometimes they don't fill up that much. Um, it's just one of those things where, you know, sometimes there's four games in a day. There's different fan bases. You know, you have to buy uh, double, you know, you have to buy tickets for both games. So yeah. if you get, let's say, you know, you get Houston, uh, against Longwood and then Nebraska, Texas A&M, all those Houston fans are going to buy their tickets and then they're probably not going to show up for the Nebraska, Texas A&M game. So it's one of those things where those fans yeah. kind of clear out. Um, but, you know, the big fan base is travel. And I, I think it's, you know, it's a great, great uh, tradition that March Madness is. And, you know, the games are always so exciting and stuff like that. So I, I think that we're in for a treat. I mean, I know, you know, we got a lot of one-two seeds, not too many upsets um, now with higher seats, but we're going to have some big time games. I got to bring up one comment and then get one uh, comment from you. And then we'll end the show. Look who's here. Kelly Dorman. Kelly. Big, Kelly. What's up, Kelly? Cody's wish fame. A uh, wonderful father to Kylie and Cody and wonderful uh, wife. Leslie says, hello guys, Patrick. Last time that I uh, seen you was in the winter circle at the breeders cup. Looking forward to seeing everyone in a few weeks. He's going to be at Keeneland, by the way, Patrick. I don't know if you knew that, but I think he's going to be at Keeneland. So we'll see him in a few weeks. UConn is going to win it all from Kelly Dorman uh, of uh, Cody Dorman and Kylie Dorman's father. I can't say good uh, enough great things. I, we should tell the story of how you got in the winner's circle, but we don't have time for that now. Maybe we'll save that for uh, another show. But thanks, Kelly, for popping on. Appreciate it. Patrick, who's going to win it all? I know you're going to talk Wednesday. I think you told me before this whole thing started who your top pick was, and I poo-pooed it a little bit because this team and coach has never really come through in the clutch in this tournament. But just get tell everyone who you picked before the tournament even started. Yeah, I like Purdue to win it all. You know, I think Matt Painter's, you know, caught some, you know, trash for what he's done in the past. But I, I think this team is on a mission. Uh, they're one year older. And, you know, they got the big man, Edie, in the middle there. Uh, I think UConn and Purdue will match up in the national championship game, and it will be uh, one for the ages. That will be a game to watch. That would be fun. Well, Pat, we really appreciate your intel on college basketball, horse racing, everyone else. Pat, where can people follow you? Because I know you don't put on the banner there. Where can people follow you on X? Let, let, we need to get your uh, X handle pushed up a little bit. Yes, yeah, so it's uh, at Patrick Kunzel. So it's just... Backspace my last name, to, and it's just straight across Pat, at Patrick Kunzel. There you go. At Patrick Kunzel, check him out. Pat's, uh will we'll chime in. He's also a big golf guy, too, so maybe he's got some thoughts on the Masters coming up soon. We got or, that. We're in Keeneland during the Masters. Oh, we gosh. Will, <laughs> we will be. Boy, that, what a weekend that is going to be. Pat, thanks a lot, man. Appreciate it. We can see you on Wednesday, right, the B&B &B guys, correct? Yes. See everybody Wednesday night. 
All right. For my co-host, Patrick Hunzel, this has been Howard Kravitz, episode 14 of Horse and Around. Really appreciate it. Huge viewership. I emailed it out. We got show Wednesday, Thursday, and then Pat, Saturday, Davey Lane is back for the Dubai World Cup card. I love these shows. We've already been working on our pick six, by the way, for the <laughs> Dubai World Cup. We cash big at Saudi. We're going to do it again. Maybe you and I need to talk if you want, you know, maybe a little piece well, of that. Maybe make sure to, you know, know exactly what your ticket is, you know, when the race goes off. So, you know, you don't think you lost. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> no, you're uh, exactly that right. Great. Su- that was great. That was fantastic. $10,000 score yeah. at, on uh, Saudi Cup Day. Thanks a lot, Pat. Take care. Everyone, crush your bets this week at any tracks you play. Take care. See you later. Bye-bye. podcast you're missing out it's one of the best podcasts in the country